Good morning, everybody. We have about 260 some households on right now and it's still growing. Uh, thanks for joining us for the third installment of As the Prop Turns. This morning on the call, we have VP of Fluid Motion, Jeff Mesmer. Morning. We have a general manager of Fluid Motion, Andrew Custis. And the customer service manager, Kenny Mars. Wow. Morning. <laughs> Yeah. Tim Bates is our delivery captain and engine specialist, and he's going to be uh, hosting the presentation today. Woo! Brian Dickout is our marketing associate. Good morning. And my name is Sam Bissett, and uh, we're going to cover a couple quick notes here real quick. Most of you, it looks like you found it. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you click that, it opens a window where you can ask questions that are then displayed on the screen of all the panelists here. So that's where you can ask your questions. We will do our best to answer all of those, specifically the ones that are on topic for today's presentation. And then anything that we don't get to today, we'll do our best to follow up with after the webinar. If anything does happen today and we lose the broadcast for some reason, Check your email. We'll have a new link out to you within just a few minutes and we'll, we'll uh, start up a new meeting and um, finish it up. Uh, within 24 hours of us ending this, I will send an email to everyone that's on the webinar this morning that has a video version of this and uh, any documents that pertain to the presentation. So we'll send you a full list of the questions and answers and a video link on YouTube. Uh, so you can follow along at your own speed afterwards. Okay, we're going to play our little uh, intro video here real quick. And now, for the next 30 minutes, as the prop turns. Brought to you today and Cutwater Boats, quality cruising and real community. What's a weekly podcast without a recurring theme? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get out of the way and introduce Tim Bates one more time. He's going to host our presentation this morning. So Tim, go ahead and take it away. All right. So today, as Sam mentioned, we're going to be talking about a little bit of spring maintenance. Uh, this is part one, hosted by me, Tim Bates. As Sam also said, I do all of our factory deliveries. Um, also, the Volvo certified engine technician for the company. So Brian's Photoshop skills here put to the test. Um, he, uh, he did this this morning. Uh, first part of today, we're going to talk a little bit about my tool bag, what I carry in my tool bag, um, recommended tools to have on board for you. So here is a picture of my Vito Pro Pack Tech Pack. Um, you can fit quite a bit of tools in this bag here. Um, a lot of the tools that you'll see are going to be standard socket set, screwdrivers, that kind of thing. But there are a couple specialty tools that we definitely want to talk about um, that maybe most people don't carry. So here is every tool I carry in my bag. Uh, believe it or not, I was able to fit all of those tools in that bag I just showed you. Uh, the next couple slides here, I'm going to break down exactly what I have. Um, like I said, a lot of it's standard stuff, you know, sockets, wrenches, um, bits, that kind of thing, but a couple of these um, we definitely want to highlight and make sure that you have on board with you. So on the left side here, um, this is one side of that tool bag that I just showed. I have all my socket sets at the top left. These are all standard sockets, so uh, just a standard socket. Uh, most of the hardware on the boat is going to be standard. If you're doing any kind of engine work, whether it's the Yamaha or the Volvo, you're going to want to have some uh, metric sockets on board, but for most of the boat stuff, you can have just a standard socket set, standard set of wrenches. A um, couple of the items that you see highlighted in green here are going to be those maybe not so common items. So hose clamp pliers will be uh, these two items down below. 
What those do is they basically allow you to pinch off a fuel hose or a coolant hose, uh, any kind of hose to restrict the flow while you're changing out a, uh, you know, a hose clamp or fixing a connection. Um, I bought mine, they're a Blue Point uh, brand. I bought mine off a of Snap on Truck, but you can order those online. Uh, snap ring pliers up here on the top. Those are going to be uh, best for you know the 29s and 31s. If you're doing any kind of uh, shear pin replacements on your thrusters, there's a snap ring on those thrusters that you'll need to get off. Um, a few of the engines have snap rings as well, so uh, definitely good to have those on board. Right to the left of those, we have a set of uh, specialty PEX hose cutters. If you're doing any kind of water filter installations or um, need to cut any PEX hose, these will actually cut that hose without crimping or deforming the hose. So uh, another one you can source online, um, definitely good to have in the bag. Other than that, just regular adjustable wrenches, uh, tape measure, pliers, um, we have wire strippers and wire crimpers here if you're doing any kind of electrical work. Set of flush cut zip tie cutters. Um, that way you don't have that little nub on the zip tie that uh, likes to cut up your hands and arms. Uh, vice grips, needle nose vice grips up here on the top left. And then uh, pipe sealant and Teflon tape over to the left here. The right side of my bag, I carry a uh, rechargeable LED flashlight. That's what you'll see up here. Doesn't have to be rechargeable, but uh, it does make it nice so you can plug it into an outlet and uh, recharge it right there on board. Uh, you'll see me, Kenny, Andrew, Ivan, all of us carry the M12 uh, right angle drill. That will accept any kind of drill bit, um, you know, standard bit, anything that you need to do to get into tight spaces. It's a really nice drill to have on board. Uh, have a couple extra batteries with you as well. Uh, right below my bit set here is going to be a ratcheting screwdriver. Uh, just like my drill, that's able to accept any standard bit. Um, nice to have a short one there so you can get into tight spots. Uh, that one also ratchets. The, uh, the bit set here, probably the most important part of that bit besides your standard Phillips and flatheads is you want to have a, uh, a set of square bits. Uh, it's a Robertson bit, but there's four different size square bits. Uh, most common in our boats is going to be a number two square bit. Almost all of our hardware is going to be that same style square bit head screw or fastener. Um, but there's a number zero, number one, number two, and number three um, size for those square heads. So if you're taking panels off the boat or doing any kind of work on the boat, uh, you definitely want to have those square bits on board. Um, over here I have a number two just standard square bit screwdriver. Uh, right to the left of that I have a, a nut driver. This is going to be a 5 16 nut driver for uh, tightening hose clamps. Uh, almost all your hose clamps you can tighten with that one tool. Down below there we have uh, metric and standard Allen wrenches. So metric over on the right, standard on the left, it's definitely good to have on board. Uh, back to wiring, if you're doing any kind of wiring, we definitely recommend using a heat shrink connector. Um, to do the heat shrink or to tighten up that heat shrink, you can use a butane torch. Uh, we do want to recommend to be careful using a torch on board around any, um, you know, gas tanks, fuel tanks, um, upholstery. Uh, you could definitely make a mess using that thing. Right below it, we have a folding utility knife. Just good to have a knife on board. Electrical tape. Um, probably the most important tool in my bag is my multimeter. We all carry a AC clamp meter. Um, during Andrew's seminar, he talked a lot about measuring amp loads, especially on the, uh, the AC side of things. Uh, this is gonna allow you to do that. So it's worth the money to buy a good meter and have a meter on board to, uh, to diagnose any kind of electrical issues that you're having. Um, or just measure your amp draw. Uh, right to the right of that, we have a AC 110 outlet tester. So if you don't know if the outlet's working correctly or if you think there might be an issue there, that will plug right into your outlet and allow you to test that outlet easily. Zip ties, Sharpie, pretty standard stuff there. Um, and then this is my uh, fuse kit here. So I carry just a random, basically assortment of blade fuses uh, for all of our different boats. Uh, your boat may be a little bit more specific, so you could always look at your fuse block diagram that's in the owner's manual and uh, make sure you have a good assortment of blade fuses on board. Uh, I also carry some heat shrink wire connectors in there. So if you're doing any additional installations or 
um, looking to add anything to the boat, it's good to have an assortment of wire connections available. Okay, here's a couple more specialty tools that you didn't see on that first slide. So uh, over to the left, we have a rigid E110 offset hex head wrench. Um, I sourced both these parts on Amazon.com. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the hex wrenches here when we talk about the uh, packing gland or the stuffing box adjustment. Uh, these are a nine and a half inch wrench. Um, they do have a bigger version available, but I find that the nine and a half works great for, uh, for all of our boats. Over to the right, we have a gear wrench heavy duty oil filter wrench. This is going to work on any filters, so fuel filters, oil filters, um, any spin on type filter. So um, I know some of the D4s, D3s, uh, Volvos can come uh, from the factory and that fuel filter is kind of a, a hard one to get off the first go around. This is going to be your best friend when you're, uh, you're changing those filters out. Uh, the one in the picture here will be for filters from sizes three and three quarters to four and a half inches. The model number for that is 2320D. Um, once again, I ordered both of these on amazon.com. All right, so enough about tools. We'll talk a little bit about what spare parts we like to carry on board. Um, we've broken down these next two slides into an inboard boat versus an outboard boat. Uh, so for your diesel inboards, whether it's the Volvo um, or the Anmar or way back in the day, the Cummins, a um, couple of these spares are more of an emergency spare. If you were to you know, have an issue out on the water, you definitely want to have these on board. Um, some of them are just nice if you're doing some more remote cruising um, you know, you have an issue, you have something you need to fix, have something on board. So starting at the top here, we have filters. So that could be oil filters, fuel filters, um, you know, Webasto diesel heater, fuel filter, any of the filters on board, great to carry as a spare throughout the season. Um, if you're doing your own maintenance, or even if you're not, you can always use those filters for the maintenance and then replace your spares kit when you do that. Uh, probably the most important item on this list is going to be your impeller. Whether it's an outboard or an inboard, you're going to have to have seawater provided to the motor. Um, the impeller is what you're able to, to install to do that. Uh, spare belts. So once again, depending on the engine, uh, you're either going to have one or two belts. Uh, the D4s are going to be a single belt, whereas the D3s and D6s will have two belts. So make sure you have the correct bolt, uh, belts on board. Uh, the next two are, are nice to carry, especially if you're in kind of a remote area. Maybe parts aren't so easily to find. Um, you know, a potable water pump for your fresh water system on board uh, and a macerator. I hear a lot of our, our customers that are going up, uh, you know, further north like to carry both these items on board. If you do have an issue, you're able to replace it right there on the spot. Uh, back to blade fuses, just make sure you get a good assortment. Um, our boats use anything from a one amp to a 40 amp blade fuse. So you definitely want to have the correct fuse on board. They're cheap, uh, easy to replace parts that can save you a lot of headaches down the road. a &L fuses. So this is the blade fuse here, standard automotive blade fuse. Right above that is what's called an a &L fuse. Um, a lot of our boats will have inverters or thrusters that use this style of fuse. Um, the amperage will change a little bit. So you see this one in the pictures, a 250 amp fuse. Uh, make sure you have the correct a &L fuses on board. Uh, all of our spare parts form list what size amp fuses are required for your model. Um, heat shrink electrical connectors, like I talked about earlier, you just want to have those on board if you need to, to do a quick wiring connection. Um, you know, if you're doing any uh, kind of additional installations, they're good to have the heat shrink style connections to make sure that connection is nice and, and watertight. Spare fluids for the diesel would be coolant, um, transmission fluid, and engine oil. Um, so definitely have those on board, at least a quart of, uh, of each of the, the engine oil and the transmission fluid and a gallon of the coolant. Uh, bilge pump with float. So make sure you're getting the correct bilge pump for your boat. We do stock these in our parts department as well. Um, you know, it's another cheap, easy to, easy to replace part that's good to have on board should you have an issue with the one that you, ha you have on board. <clears throat> Shower bilge and float. So that's going to be the shower uh, box basically on your boat. Um, you don't need to carry the entire box, but at least a float and the bilge pump that's inside the box. Down to the right here, we have a thruster shear pin. So from model to model, this will change a little bit as far as uh, which pin you need. But once again, that's on our spare parts form uh, for your model. 
And then I like to carry nav and anchor light bulbs. So a lot of the boats, these will be the exact same bulb. The nav light will be interchangeable with the anchor lights, um, another item on our spare parts for. So moving over to the outboards. Uh, for the outboards, it's a lot of the same items. So fuses, um, filters, a lot of those will be the same. Um, you know, fuel filters, oil filters for the, the outboard. Definitely want to have an impeller on, on board for that one as well. Um, for the outboards, there's an engine flush port on the side of the engine where you're able to hook up a garden hose and flush the salt water out of the motor. Um, we've had those come off when you're going to do the flush, you know, you, you pull the gasket off and the gasket falls in the water. It's a good one to have on board, um, you know, in case you have that happen. Assortment of fuses. So this is a look at the inside of my fuse box. It has the assortment of fuses on the top here and then a couple of the heat shrink connectors down here on the bottom. ANL fuse, this one happens to be for a uh, Ranger 23 thruster. Um, thruster shear pin down below, nav and anchor light replacements just like the inboard, water pump and macerator just like the inboard, additional fluids. The only difference there is you won't have coolant or transmission fluid with the outboard. Uh, you'll still wanna carry a quart of oil and a uh, quart of the lower unit fluid on board. Uh, bilge pump with float and the shower bilge and float as well. All right, so for our inboard boats, your boat has what's called a stuffing box or a packing gland. This is basically the uh, seal from where the shaft goes through the hole um, and it's what keeps that water tight. So, you know, what is a stuffing box? The stuffing box houses uh, basically a packing material uh, which is used to seal the, seal the shaft going through the hole. Um, it should be inspected and regularly tightened. So you always want to keep an eye on that and make sure that number one, you don't have an excessive drip. It's not dripping too, too frequently, but you also do, you do want to see a drip. Um, this should remain cool to the touch. So if it's overly tightened, um, you're probably too tight. If you're getting a, a lot of water in the bilge, you probably need to tighten it up. So this goes back to those rigid E110 offset, offset X head wrenches that we talked about earlier, uh, the nine and a half version. Uh, these two wrenches are what's going to allow you to tighten up that stuffing box. So on this slide, we talk about how to adjust. So with one wrench, you'd want to hold the stuffing box, uh, which is the first one here. The stuffing box is the larger of the two, basically the, the adjustment nut. Um, and then you want to loosen the locking nut, which is the back one here. So if you turn the locking nut towards the back of the boat, while holding the adjustment nut here, that'll basically free these two from each other. Uh, with the locking nut loosened, you wanna tighten or loosen that stuffing box until you achieve the right drip rate. So what you're looking for is a drip every 15 to 20 seconds uh, while the engine is running and in idle gear. Uh, with the engine turned off, you shouldn't have a constant drip. If you're seeing uh, a drip every 15 to 20 seconds with the engine not running, you probably need to tighten a little bit. Uh, to monitor the drip rate, you definitely want to have the shaft turning. So either do it at the dock with line secure. Um, you know, I usually will go into forward idle and have somebody on the outside of the boat uh, holding onto a bow rail. Make sure that the boat's going to rest nicely up against the side of the dock. Um, you know, lines are tight. Um, the other option would be underway. So if you're out away from the marina in an open area, calm water, you could always go into forward idle. Uh, make sure you have somebody on lookout watching off the front of the boat. Um, once you have those, you know, adjusted properly, you can use a penetrating oil. You'll see on the picture here, uh, we have a little bit of kind of that bluish green look to this one. When they're new, they have a, a nice bronze, uh, brass look to them. Over time, as it gets salt water down there, you'll see that happen a little bit. Uh, it's purely cosmetic. It doesn't hurt the stuffing box at all. Um, but if you wanted to keep it clean, you could always hit it with a, a brass wire brush use a little bit of penetrating oil and a corrosion spray on it. Petting training oil will also help loosen these nuts up. So if they're really tight, you can always spray those down with some penetrating oil before you go to adjust. So over on the right here, we have a picture of how to adjust. So if you're loosening the backing nut here, you just wanna hold the adjustment nut in place while you turn the locking nut down to the right. This is facing, the right would be facing the aft side of the boat. The engine would be over here on the left. 
So in this next clip, we have a little video of uh, why you definitely want to make sure that your lines are tight. Um, I think this guy was trying to adjust his packing uh, there in the marina. So, a good example of what not to do there. Swimming in the water yeah. last Friday. All right. So, if uh, we just talked about loosening, so to tighten or loosen, and once you actually have the the backing nut, you know, backed away from the adjustment nut, at this point, you're either going to tighten to get less of a drip, or loosen to get more of a drip. Uh, on the left here, you have a picture of how to tighten. So, once the lo uh, locking nut is loose in several turns. You can turn the stuffing box or the adjustment nut clockwise towards the back of the boat uh, until you get that drip rate that you're looking for. Um, make sure to, to basically retighten that locking nut once you get the correct drip rate. And then that's when you would want to monitor that drip rate with the engine running um, and in gear. Um, you don't want to adjust this with the engine running and in gear. So I'll always turn the motor off, adjust the packing, and then once everything's back to tight, turn the motor back on and go into forward idle. Um, if you've over tightened, so you look back there, the engine's running, you're in gear and you're getting no drip, at that point you would need to loosen a little bit. Um, to loosen, you would once again loosen up the backing nut away from the adjustment nut, turn the stuffing box counterclockwise or towards the front of the boat, and then retighten up the locking nut and monitor that drip rate. So, you know, simply if you're trying to tighten, all you're doing is you're, you're turning the locking or I'm sorry, the adjustment nut towards the back of the boat. If you're trying to loosen, get more of a drip, you need to turn this larger adjustment nut towards the front of the boat. Are there any questions? Just working on my uh, video. Oh, my. There we go. I are we live? That was great, Tim. Uh, yeah. that? <laughs> that, uh, we do we do have a, a few questions. <laughs> Is your heater not working, Brian? Yeah, yeah. The weather kind of took a turn for the worse there. <laughs> all right. That's uh all right. So Tim on there. There's a couple uh Couple questions. Okay. Are there are there any Imperial hex Allen key nuts on the Volvo? Uh, they'll all be metric. So everything on the Volvo, whether it's uh, a standard bolt or a you know a hex head bolt, you're going to always have a uh, a metric tool that you'll need for the Volvo and the Yamaha. Okay, and then. Um, Got another one. Should should they carry a torque wrench for replacing a spare belt on a D4 300 Volvo? Yeah, so the, the torque wrench that I use is a, a half inch torque wrench. So they have different size torque wrenches, anywhere from quarter inch to half inch. Um, but for the belt tensioner on the D4s, there's a, there's a spot that you can install that half inch torque wrench. And you're going to torque that belt to 52 foot pounds. Um, the D4s and D6s are a, um, you know, a self basically torquing belt. So you have to, you have to tension the belt yourself, whereas the D3s have a belt tensioner uh, built in with the engine. Perfect. So we kind of left engine maintenance out of this seminar. This is more of an all around boat. We do, we do touch in on uh, different engine related items, but um, we didn't go real deep on some of those. If you're doing an engine maintenance, then I would absolutely have a torque wrench on board. Okay. And then uh, there's quite a few questions just about part numbers, where to get the spare parts. And I think for everybody there, the, the uh, most, most important is we do put uh, all of our spare parts forms of what we offer and those will be expanded, but those are on the uh, tugnuts.com website. So under the uh, forum index, uh, I think I have to post them under the Ranger Tug Factory technical bulletins. Uh, but you'll be able to see part numbers and um, forms there. And our parts department is open and uh, we are doing shipping every uh, Friday. So if anybody wants to get uh, orders submitted, you're welcome to do that. 
Yeah, um, for parts, it's just parts at rangertugs.com. Uh, Richard's able to ship just about anything that we stock nationwide. So uh, other than fluids, which I think you can't ship engine coolant and oil, uh, anything else you see on that spare parts form, he's able to ship to you. Okay, perfect. And then there's one more, Tim, that we have one from Scott. He says his stuffing box doesn't look like that. And I'm guessing he's got a uh, Cutwater 30 with an inboard. Can you just, since we didn't capture any pictures of what that one is, can you uh, maybe go into that one just a little bit? Yeah, that one is quite a bit different. There's um, there's a couple bolts that you need to loosen up first. Um, and that one will allow you to adjust similar to the one that we just saw, but there'll be a couple extra steps there where you have to loosen up the bolts on the packing uh, before you're able to adjust. Perfect. All right. I think we're, uh, the we're other, uh, Andrew, one of the customers said that they, uh, aren't very mechanical and what parts should they carry. And I think that whether they're doing the work or whether they're on a trip and, and maybe something has to be done, it's a good idea to carry all of the parts that Tim's recommending, uh, so that you have those so that, you don't have to wait a, you know, two days or a week to get a part if you're you know, off the beaten path. Absolutely. Certainly, rock, rock on, Jeff. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, that's exactly how we answered it. Is even if you don't know how to do it, uh, it's good to carry the parts. All right. Yeah, it's quite a bit easier to find somebody to work on the boat than it is to find some of these parts sometimes. So uh, as long as you have parts, you can usually find somebody willing to to help you install. Uh, and the last, just one more, Tim, this one I is, uh, he, uh, Kirby heard that penetrating oil can damage the seal on the transmission, but we're, we're not talking about anything related to the transmission on this with the packing, right? Correct. Yeah. Everything here is going to be after the transmission. So definitely read the can of whatever you're using, make sure that you're using it as specified, but, um, you know, on this one, you're really just trying to get it in the threads between the adjustment and the locking nut. Yep. And uh, yeah. And looks like Janet wants to know if there's a shortage of razors in Washington. Oh, why? why would you ask that? I, I have no idea where that I don't know why that's even brought up right now. Barbers and hair salons and everything. Oh, shut down, so I, uh, this is how fast my hair grows in the matter of 10 minutes. I mean, it's out of control. I, I shaved this morning. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, uh, we'll continue on here. <laughs> All right, so moving on here. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about bilge pumps, uh, maintenance and operations. So depending on the year of your boat, there's gonna be a couple different style pumps uh, that we've installed over the years. Anything newer from, I think 2017 and on is gonna be the rule bilge pump you see here at the top right. Um, they're a little bit different as far as operation and how they work compared to some of the older style bilge pumps. Um, Anything previous to 2017, we used a separate float and a Johnson bilge pump. It would look, um, has a, a basically a red base and a black cap. Um, that style bilge pump had a separate float that had two sensors on the front of the float here. Uh, probably the most important part of those is keeping this sensor face clean. Uh, if you get any oil or any debris on the front of that sensor, it can cause the pump to turn on. Um, and think that there's water in the bilge when there's not. So common maintenance on the older style pumps is to get down there, wipe off the face of the sensor, um, make sure that you're keeping it clean down there, um, you know, free of any oil, that kind of thing. Uh, to test the float on this style, all you would do is you would cover this circle here and this, this circle here with your fingers, and that would replicate water being over that float. Uh, the newer style pumps don't have any separate floats. So they're a sensor built inside of the pump. And every two and a half minutes, that pump's going to spin and look for any water in the bilge. If it senses any resistance, it's going to turn the pump on until all the water's gone. Um, so every two and a half minutes, you'll hear that thing buzz looking for water. Um, it's about a one second burst. Uh, to make sure that that's working correctly, you can easily just go back to your engine room or your center cockpit hatch and listen for that sound. Um, also, your switches on your dash will light up every time uh, that that burst occurs. So if it's rainy, if it's nasty outside, you don't want to go out and listen for it, you can always watch the manual switch and it will light up as you hear that burst. Um, the one down on the bottom left here is going to be what you'll see more 
often than not inside of a shower sump box. So your shower drain box has a physical mechanical float uh, that as the water enters the box will rise and activate the bilge pump. So next we're going to talk a little bit about cleaning the, uh, the rule bilge pumps here. Uh, to remove this pump, uh, you can easily do so by removing the hose first. You don't need to pull any hose clamps or remove the physical hose from this fitting. All you'll do is you'll loosen up the fitting on the pump there and remove the entire assembly away from the pump. Uh, once that's unscrewed, you can press these two blue buttons down here and one on the opposite side, and this pump will lift straight up out of the basket. So uh, we always recommend to pull the fuse for the float. Anytime you're working on the bilge pump, especially if you're going to have your fingers or any kind of tools in the bottom of the pump here, you want to remove the fuse for that bilge. That way uh, it doesn't do that two and a half minutes since looking for water while you have your fingers in there. Um, depending on your boat, that fuse will be in a couple different locations, but that fuse is wired directly to the batteries. So even if all your house switches are off, um, you know, even if the, the bilge pump switches are off, uh, regardless, that thing is always going to be on uh, looking for water. Uh, once the pump's out, you want to inspect the bottom of that pump um, as well as the basket. So pull the pump out of the basket, look down inside of the bottom of the basket here, make sure you don't have any debris in the base, but also make sure you don't have any debris in the bottom of the pump. If you do, definitely make sure that that fuse is out of there so it doesn't do that automatic sense and clean out the pump. So down here we have just another, you know, important reminder, uh, remove the bilge pump fuse when cleaning, uh, and then also make sure to reinstall the fuse after you're done. So all of our bilge pumps have that automatic feature, whether it's the separate float that has the two circles on it or the automatic two and a half minute sense, those are always going to be wired directly to the batteries um, to make sure that you, you know, if you get water in the bilge, it's going to pump it out even if you're not on board. Um, and then all of, our, all of our boats also have a manual switch to turn on the bilge. So this picture happens to be a uh, R31. It's a little bit different than some of your boats, but um, this bilge pump one and two here, here, this will physically turn your pump on. So if that float were to burn out or if you were to have an issue with the fuse for the float, if the automatic feature isn't working on the bilge pump, uh, these switches will allow you to physically turn on the pump and evacuate water from the bilge. Um, a lot of the new 23s, 25s, 27s, um, I think even the new 29, all those will have this switch up on your dash. And they will be labeled bilge pump one and two, uh, but all that is is basically a bypass to the float to physically turn the pump on in the event that the float's not working. Um, so for uh, operation here to verify proper automatic operation, all you're doing is you're listening for that one second burst every two and a half minutes. Uh, like I said that earlier, you can also watch this LED. Even with this switch off, uh, when, the, when the bilge pump senses water, you'll see this light light up for a brief second while it's doing that. Uh, on the, you know, the 23s and 25s where the switch is up on the dash, you'll see the same thing. It'll, it'll light up momentarily while the pump is looking for water. Um, so if that breaker or if that switch is on, like I said, that'll physically turn the pump on. You definitely want to leave these switches in the off position, otherwise you'll burn up that pump. So next we're going to talk a little bit about bilge pump fuses. Um, this section is good for all blade fuses, but specifically your bilge pump fuses. Um, over here on the right we have a picture of the hot fuse block on an R31. Um, when I say hot, that means that it's wired directly to the batteries. So everything on this fuse block is going to go directly to its respective battery. Um, doesn't matter if your house, engine, thruster battery switches are on or off, these will always have power. The only way to cut power to those floats is by removing these fuses here and here. So if you were cleaning, you would want to pull these seven and a half amp fuses out of there to make sure that that automatic feature isn't still uh, looking for water. So checking fuses to verify that your fuses are not the source of a problem, uh, you can either use a multimeter to check continuity. So if you go to the continuity setting on your, on your multimeter, you can check from here to here, and you should have continuity between these two points. Uh, if the fuse is still in the panel, you can also check continuity from here to here. That tells you that this little wire inside of the fuse is not blown. 
Uh, if you're just doing a visual inspection, you could always remove the fuse from the panel. And if you can see that wire in there has been broken, uh, usually you'll see it'll look burned. Um, then that fuse is no longer good and needs replaced. Uh, definitely always make sure to use the correct size amp fuse. So, you know, some of the older bilge pumps, the uh, Johnson bilge pumps required a five amp fuse. The new rule bilge pumps are a seven and a half amp fuse. You wouldn't want to use a seven and a half amp for the Johnson uh, bilge pumps. You would want to definitely stick with whatever size that pump uh, recommends. So newer style bilge pumps are a seven and a half amp fuse. Older style bilge pumps will be a five, which isn't shown here in the picture. Uh, just a note down here at the bottom that this fuse block is wired directly to the battery. Um, doesn't matter what boat you have, all of our boats will be wired directly. So the fuse blocks will be in a little bit different location from model to model, um, but you will always have a bilge pump float wired directly to a battery. That way, once again, if you turn off all the switches, you still have that ability to pump out water. Okay, so enough about fuses. Now we're going to talk a little bit about your potable water system. Now, we took this page directly from the Clorox website. Um, and what this is is a breakdown for how much bleach to use when sanitizing your freshwater systems. Um, so right here it says to clean out a water tank, first thoroughly flush the tank. We're going to talk about how to flush uh, in the next slide. Um, but the bleach solution that you want to use is basically one part bleach to every 150 parts of water. Um, so you can break that down for your size tank. Um, but just for nice even numbers here, if you had a 50 gallon water tank, uh, you would want to use three parts bleach to that 50 gallons of water. So you can read that there. You can also go to Clorox website uh, down below. Um, just a nice one to do, especially at the beginning of the season. If it were me, I would probably do this at the beginning of the, the year, but also at the end of the year before you store the boat. Um, it just gets that tank nice and clean, especially if you're drinking the water. All right, so for flushing that fresh water system, first thing you want to do is turn on your water pump. Um, model to model, that switch will vary as far as the location, but turn on and pressurize the water system. And then you want to go and open up all your faucets in the head, the galley, uh, maybe you have a, a cockpit shower, open up everything and allow that water to drain uh, through those items. Once you start getting air coming out of those items, you want to turn that pump back off. Um, at that point, you would want to fill the system back up using your fresh water fill outside the boat. So the idea there is turn the pump on, open up all the faucets, drain everything out of the system. Then you can close everything up, turn the pump off, and then fill that tank back up. And you could repeat that process a couple times to, to get some nice clean water circulated through the system. So cleaning faucet strainers. Um, you know, if you're starting to get low pressure on your water system, most likely it's one of two things. It's either a faucet or it's a water pump strainer issue. So on this first slide here, we're gonna talk about how to clean the faucets. Um, you know, if the entire boat has low pressure, most likely it's a water pump strainer that needs to be cleaned. If it's a local issue, if it's just the dinette sink, if it's just a head sink, um, then you know, definitely check the strainer inside of that faucet. So over time, a little bit of debris can collect inside of that strainer. Um, to clean that strainer, you would basically uh, remove the strainer from the faucet itself. Uh, definitely be careful to lose any small parts by covering the drain with a cloth. Um, you could also put your sink stoppers that come with the boat down in here. Um, last thing you want to do is drop a screw and, and have it go overboard. Um, all of our boats don't have gray water tanks, so anything that goes down the sink goes directly over the side of the boat. Um, first step is to unscrew the retaining nut, which is this nut right here that holds the strainer in place. Uh, we're using a 7 8 inch wrench here to do that. You could also use an adjustable wrench or, or, or a crescent wrench, but we find that a 7 8 makes it uh, a little bit easier. So the next step here is to remove the strainer. Uh, once again, going back to covering this little uh, drain here, you don't want to lose the spring down the drain or of course the strainer. So, um, you know, have something in that drain to make sure you, you keep everything on board. 
Uh, once this is nice and clean, you usually just rinse it out. Uh, you can use a little bristle brush to, um, to clean everything up. Uh, you'll just reinstall using basically just the reverse order of, uh, of removal. Next step here is going to be your um, shower sump. So this will be a you know very um, common shower sump box that you'll see on our boats. Every boat will have something very similar to this one. Uh, the bilge pump inside the box may be a little bit different from model to model, uh, but overall this design is going to be very standard on our boats. Um, so as shower water enters the box here, inside you have a cylinder strainer, which is going to collect any hair and debris that gets down the drain. Um, that, you know, basically keeps it inside of the strainer to where it doesn't get into your mechanical float or your bilge pump over here, which will evacuate that water overboard. So water in, inside of this strainer, and then it get, basically fills up, it activates the float and pumps it overboard. Uh, first step is to locate where your shower sump box is. So different models, once again, these are in different spots. The 31, it happens to be underneath the uh, forward salon bed. This is right behind the waste tank here. Uh, the 29 is also in the forward salon below the floor. Um, but, you know, different models will once again be in different locations. Uh, first step to get inside the box here is to remove these four Phillips screws at the top of the box. Uh, the clear lid makes it nice to visually inspect. So if you're looking to uh, just see what's in there and do a visual inspection, you don't need to remove the lid. But for actually removing the strainer, you would definitely want to remove these four Phillips screws here and here. Um, I've heard of a lot of people after they shower, you definitely want to just rinse some clean water through that system. So you just got done, you know, washing, washing your hair. You don't want to leave a bunch of shampoo and soap inside of this box. So after I shower on the boat, I usually do a fresh water flush directly down the drain for a couple minutes uh, just to get this box nice and clean. Um, I've also had a lot of owners do a little bit of Dawn dish soap right down the drain from time to time. Uh, a very small amount will actually clean this box up nicely. So the next one here is once you have the lid off, how to clean the shower sump strainer. So this strainer is just held in place by a couple clips here and here. All you'll do is you'll pry the box back a little bit and lift this strainer right out of the box. Um, all the debris will be on the inside. So take it off the boat, clean it up. Uh, once it's clean, go ahead and reinstall. Once it's back in place, you would put the cover back on. This bilge pump here would be very similar to the bilge pump we talked about earlier, where you just have a couple releases on either side of the pump, where you can lift that pump straight up and inspect the bottom for anything and uh, make sure it's clean of debris. This float up here is a mechanical float. So once again, it'll rise as the water rises. Another good one to inspect, make sure you don't have any contaminants in that float. Moving on here to the potable water pump. So once again, from model to model, this pump will look a little bit different, but this process will be the same uh, regardless of what year your boat is. So very first step here to remove this strainer in order to clean it is to slide the blue retainer tab on the strainer housing. So that's going to be basically in two spots. You'll have one right here, which is hidden by the strainer in this picture. It's back here. And then also this hose is held to the strainer with that same clip. So you'll have two of these clips that you'll need to remove in order to pull that strainer off of the pump. Um, so it doesn't really matter which order you do that. On this model, uh, Andrew said that this hose was a little bit shorter. So he removed the retainer clip for this one first, and then he was able to remove the hose from the strainer. Once that was off, he pulled this clip away from the pump and was able to pull the entire assembly away from the pump. So once you have that assembly uh, away from the pump, you can pull it off the boat, pull it out of the back deck, and you can clean this strainer right here. Um, especially on brand new boats, you may see a little bit of tank shavings on there. Um, any debris that gets into your water system is going to collect inside of the strainer. This one would be a, a good item to check in the spring, but also a good one to check, you know, maybe monthly on your boat, just to make sure that you're keeping it clean. Um, if you're drinking the water, you definitely want to stay on top of that one keep all the debris out of the system. So once the clear plastic cap is unscrewed from the base, you could remove this strainer from the body. And that one will uh, be another one. You just go rinse it off, use a, a fine bristle brush to clean off any contaminants from the strainer. To reinstall, all you do is reverse steps one through five. 
your raw water wash down pumps on your boat uh, will be the identical pump. So if you're looking to change or um, you know replace or clean the strainer on those pumps, you can also do the same exact process for your raw water wash down pumps. Next, we're going to talk about battery connections. Um, so good to get eyes on these, especially at the start of the season. Uh, make sure no corrosion is built up over the winter time. Uh, make sure all your connections are nice and tight. I would say, um, you know, 90% of the issues that we talk about on a daily basis are loose connections. So uh, get on those batteries. Make sure all the, uh, the hardware is tight. You're not seeing a lot of corrosion on top of the batteries themselves. Uh, so first step there is to turn off the battery switches. Make sure we don't have power going to any of our devices, basically. Um, second step is to get on top of the batteries and check all of the battery terminals and bus bars. So once again, this is on a 31. Uh, these batteries are down in the cockpit lockers. And right behind the starboard bank of batteries, you have a bus bar. Um, on that one, all we're doing is we're going through and making sure that all eight of these nuts are nice and tight and that we don't see any corrosion there. Um, when you're testing or when you're tightening these connections, always make sure not to, you know, touch the positive and negative terminals to each other. Um, you know, I usually use a little stubby uh, wrench. That way I'm not in risk of touching those terminals to each other. As far as cleaning, if you do see some corrosion on those connections, um, you want to clean them up as soon as possible uh, to prevent any further corrosion. So to do that, uh, you can see that uh, we were using a battery cleaner solution in this bottom left picture and a wire brush. Um, you just want to spray basically the bus bar or the battery connections. Uh, using your brush, you can knock any of that corrosion off. Make sure those stay nice and clean. Um, they'll last a lot longer that way. After they're nice and clean, you can use a corrosion inhibitor to protect those contacts. There's lots of different brands out there. Um, but just make sure you're using one that is safe for battery connections. Are there any questions? Sorry. All right. <laughs> Kenny hasn't changed his uh, <laughs> his outfit. Are we changing? <laughs> no. I was just gonna uh, wear this the rest of the day. Tim, here's a here's a good one from uh, Captain Block. We we talked a little bit about it, but he um, wants to know if there's a, a a way to quiet down the potable water pump. And he talked earlier about an expansion tank. I had said there's an easier solution, but thought maybe you could uh, answer that one. Yeah, the, the very first thing I look for is, especially on the boats that have the PEX rigid hoses, that you don't have two of those PEX hoses that are right next to each other. Um, a lot of times, a lot of the noise that you're hearing are those two, you know, maybe it's a hot and a cold PEX, PEX hose. Uh, they're touching each other and they're vibrating, and that's where a lot of that vibration and noise can come from. Um, as far as accumulator tanks or whole house filters, um, which acts as an accumulator tank, this will also quiet down the pump a little bit. Um, I find that if you have any air in the system, this also makes the pump a little bit louder. Okay, good. And then um, how often, here's a question from Mark, how often do you recommend to replace batteries? You know, it really depends on how well you take care of them. We've seen batteries go anywhere from two to six years. There's a, a big variance there depending on how well they're taken care of. Um, if you go back to Andrew's videos of how to power manage, um, the biggest thing is the batteries don't like to be fully depleted. So you don't want to see those batteries go all the way dead um, numerous times. The less you do that, the longer your batteries are going to last. Um, we usually recommend that if you're going to replace one battery in the system, you do all the batteries. If one fails, uh, most likely the, the rest are shortly going to fail behind that. Perfect. And here's, this one's good for the Volvo side of things that, uh, is it advisable to use dielectric grease on the battery connections? And the only reason I think it's a good time to talk about dielectric grease on the Volvo, except for one part. Yeah, on the Volvos, you know, on the Volvo engine connections, you don't want to use any kind of grease. Volvo is very strict on not using any grease in their um, you know, Deutsch connections or any of that. Uh, the only exception there is on the older style Volvos where you have 
uh, exposed shift solenoid connections, you do want to insert a little bit of dielectric grease into those connections. If you look down at your transmission uh, on the older style volvos, once again, uh, you'll see a yellow connector on either side of that transmission. The top side of that connector, as well as the bottom side of that connector, you want to pack full of that dielectric grease to make sure that it's nice and tight, um, watertight. And we'll do uh, one more here from uh, Lorraine. And I, I can answer this only because I just went through this with another customer, but um, she, she has a new boat coming. It has the new style rule uh, bilge pumps. And, you know, she's going to keep it on a trailer. And a lot of the time it might be in, you know, undercover or things like that, where it's not in a marina and wants to know if she should remove the fuse uh, from the bilge pump. You and, didn't deal with this. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes on pl in places like indoor storage facilities or uh, some people call them botels, you know, they don't like anything that's running and they don't allow power to go to the boat to keep the batteries charged. So it's certainly OK. And uh, to remove the fuse, you just, you know, I would suggest if you're going to do that, you know, tape it to the steering wheel or something like that. So, you know, when you get back on the boat to put it back in so you don't forget. Absolutely. Um, and then let's see. Do you want to do the one from Ronnie? Is there a list of all things that need to be done for spring maintenance? You know, I don't think we had a list that we did at the start of this, um, this PowerPoint, um, but you could always go through the PowerPoint once we post it and look at, at what we're doing here. This isn't a, all-inclusive list, but it's a very good start uh, to get the boat ready for the season. Yep, perfect. I think we kind of focused on for this one, we, we really hit the kind of the big ones that we see, you know, quite a bit on of, you know, keeping bilge pumps and, you know, a lot of the packing, um, stuffing box and things like that, which we'll, we'll dive deeper into different, different things later on. But all right, I think your is, uh, do we have more, Tim? Is there more to the presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, we'll keep moving on here. All righty, see you guys in a bit. We'll see. Okay, so moving on here. Next, we're gonna talk about for our, uh, our Northwest Edition boats, the diesel heater maintenance. Uh, so this would be for the Webasto system. Uh, every one of the Webastos will have this black box located on your boat somewhere. So once again, this is back to the 31. Um, these are the same. doesn't matter how old your boat is. This has stayed the same for, for quite a while now. Uh, first step to get down to the filter and the pump is to remove these four Phillips screws that you see here, 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 and here. Once the cover is removed, that will expose the fuel filter, which is up on top as well as the fuel pump for the diesel heater down below. Uh, the way that this system works is you'll have a fuel feed line at the top right of this box. This is going from the diesel tank through the filter, down to the pump, and then out to your diesel heater. Um, so when replacing this fuel filter, you wanna replace it and install the new fuel filter in the same direction that you see it here. It is a directional flow filter. Um, so either refer back to this picture or when you're replacing the filter, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll pull one side of the filter off. I'll install my new filter into that side in the same orientation that this one is. Pull this hose clamp, remove the old filter, and then install the new filter onto this side of the system. So these hose clamps are gonna be a Phillips screwdriver. You can do this entire job with just a single Phillips. Uh, the, the covers, uh, the screw covers, as well as these hose clamps are just a standard Phillips. Um, loosen up the hose clamps here and here. Once those are loose, you can remove these hoses from either side of that fuel filter. Uh, we do have a note here that says to make sure you're installing that in the same uh, direction. Um, we prefer to do this annually, but another way that you'll know that this filter needs to be replaced is uh, Webasto says if you see about half full here on the filter itself, the filter is still good. If you see this is completely filled with fuel, at that point the filter needs to be changed. So the, the cartridge inside the filter at that point is restricting fuel flow and you're not providing enough fuel to your fuel pump. 
So it's either a visual inspection to make sure that it's about halfway full, like you see here in the picture, or you're going to replace that on an annual basis. Uh, for our East Coast boats, or the, uh, the luxury edition boats, we hear a lot about barnacle buster, especially in the warmer areas, um, you know, Florida, those kind of areas where um, barnacles are more of an issue than they are here in the Northwest. Um, so to prevent some of those mineral deposits um, and barnacle buildup, uh, you definitely want to use something in your seawater systems. So this is the stuff that we like, the barnacle buster, uh, different applications for this product. Um, you know, it's AC and refrigeration cooling systems. So your, your air conditioner is on board, um, inboard seawater cooling system. So whether that's your inboard diesel engine, your inboard generators, um, you can open up your strainer, you know, close the seacock on the boat first, open up the strainer, and you can pour this stuff directly into the seawater strainer, start the device and run it through the system. Uh, for our outboard boats, if you were looking to use this, you can either, with the boat out of the water, um, use the earmuffs to go down the drive, or you can do a five-gallon bucket, pour this stuff in the bucket, and use a submersible pump to pump fluid through the engine through the uh, saltwater flush. You can also put this stuff directly on um, the hull. You can put it on propellers, uh, rudders, any of those items that are prone to sea barnacles. You can absolutely brush this stuff on there uh, to help clean them up. So over time, sea life and other mineral deposits can build up, um, you know, especially at the seawater line is where we see it the most. Uh, using a descaler to clean the seawater system can help ensure proper operation over time. A um, little bit of information on Barnacle Buster down below, but it's a safe, non-toxic, and biodegradable marine growth removal uh, remover specific, specifically formulated to meet uh, an industry-wide need for fast, safe, cost-effective alternatives to mechanical cleaning of seawater-cooled equipment. So, you know, instead of pulling parts, you know, off of those items, you can basically run this through uh, to clean those systems out. says at the bottom here, most applications can be completed within four hours. So after you run, say, a, an air conditioning system, I think it's important to um, let that, you know, barnacle buster sit inside of the system for about three or four hours before you open up the seawater valve again and run that item using your raw water. Next, we're going to talk about the black water tank or the holding tank. Um, so this isn't just a, you know, springtime maintenance item. Obviously, you're doing this throughout the season as well. Um, but, you know, if you're using the pink RV antifreeze in the tanks, if that water just sits inside of that tank over the off season, um, you know, you might come down to a little bit of an odor uh, first time you use the boat in the springtime. So we're going to cover that today as well. Uh, as far as flushing this tank out, um, this is going to help to eliminate any buildup in the tank, but also any odor that you might have. Uh, so the very first step here is to empty that holding tank. So to empty, uh, make sure the wive, if, if your boat has a wive valve. So a lot of our 25 classics, 27 classics, um, they have a wive valve back in your engine room that's right in front of the black water tank. Uh, that Y valve is going to basically allow you to either do a dockside pump out or a macerator overboard discharge. Um, I think all of our newer models, most, yeah, all of the new models will not have that Y valve. So there won't be any valves that you need to open to pump out on your, you know, newer Ranger tug or cut water. Uh, but make sure if you do have a Y valve on board that it's in the correct position for pump out. Uh, a little quote from Andrew here, uh, whatever two arrows are showing is the direction it's going. So step number two here, open the waste tank cap. Uh, definitely be careful with this cap down below. It's not attached with a lanyard. Uh, the reason for that is that you have to make a nice tight vacuum seal on this port uh, when you're pumping out. So we do have this cap on our spare parts form for, uh, for good reason, but you know, on the 31 here, I would set it down below. Uh, set it in an area where it's not gonna get knocked over, um, you know, probably not the best spot that we put it here in the picture. Uh, third step here is to turn on the dockside pump out machine. This one happens to be the one down in uh, Des Moines where our factory dock is at. Uh, on this one, you just have a uh, turn on button, which is green, and a turn off button, which is red. Uh, with this 
pump turned on, you won't be sucking anything from the tank here until you open up this ball valve on the handle. Uh, first thing to do before you insert it into the, uh, the deck port here is you want to prime this system. Uh, the easiest way to do that is with the pump on, stick the uh, tip of the nozzle down into the water and open up the ball valve to allow that to prime the system. Once that's been done, close that valve back up, insert it into the deck fitting, um, and then open up this valve and you'll start to pull water out of your black water tank. The next step here, so once you've removed all of the black water uh, from the holding tank, we like to do a flush on that system. I personally flush out every time I pump out, but if you're in a time crunch, um, if you're in a spot that maybe you can't do this every time, I would, I would stick to doing this every second or third time at a minimum. Um, what this is going to do is basically you'll remove all the black water, you'll partially fill that tank back up with clean water, and then you'll pump that clean water out of that, that tank. So it's doing a flush on that system. Um, it really helps with a lot of the smell and the odors that you might have. Um, I'm always very careful not to stick this hose into the port. Um, you know, almost always you'll have a dedicated water hose right next to the uh, vacuum for the black water tanks. Um, it'll usually say something like not for potable water. Um, you wanna be very careful not to use this same hose to fill up your potable water system. So to flush, step number six here, uh, you wanna fill this tank with fresh water. Once again, for the boats that have the Y valves, you wanna make sure it's in the correct position. Otherwise, all it's gonna do is overflow off the side of the boat here. Another one to be careful of is you don't wanna overfill that tank. So you don't wanna have that you know, filling for so long that you either have black water coming back up out of the port here or through the side of the boat where the vent's located. Um, and then you'll just repeat that pump out procedures one through three. So fill the boat up with, you know, depending on your tank size, a half a tank, um, pump that out. And then after that, you'll want to reinstall the waste tank cap. Uh, we don't have it on the slide here, but there is also a way to uh, flush your vent. So if you've done this process and you're still getting a little bit of odor from the system, it could be that um, maybe at one point your tank overfilled and you started to have black water come out of the vent. Uh, the vents on our boats will always be very close to where the fill's at. So on the 31, for instance, you could almost see it down here below the rail. Um, waste here, vent down below on the side of the hole. That vent allows any air to escape from the, uh, the system. Also, when you're pumping out, um, what you're doing is you are pulling fluid out of here and you are pulling air back into the tank through the vents. So, to flush back through the vent, what you could do is pull the strainer cap off, or I'm sorry, the fitting cap off, and then you would want to force either compressed air or water back through the vent on the side of the boat, which would clean out that vent hose. Uh, after you're done with the, uh, the pump out and the flush procedure, you always want to use uh, some form of head and holding tank treatment. This happens to be probably the most common one that we see, the West Marine. Uh, blue goo that you can buy from West Marine there. Uh, they have different smelling ones, different, um, you know, different types. Um, not real picky on which one you use, but you absolutely want to use something. Uh, this is going to help eliminate odor, but it's also going to help break down any waste or tissue that's inside the tank. Uh, make sure we don't have any valves or, um, you know, issues when we're pumping out. Uh, after we pump out, you always want to put this in directly through a toilet. So you could put it right down the drain, um, I'm sorry, the pump out port, but we typically prefer to go up to uh, the toilet in the head, pour the recommended amount down into the toilet, and then flush the toilet several times to make sure that gets into the tank. Uh, this will not only clean the tank, but it will also clean all the hoses from the toilet to your tank. Um, always use the recommended amount. So on all of these, it tells you for this size tank, use this many uh, ounces of fluid. Next, we're going to talk about uh, fuel stabilizers. Uh, first one here is for our diesel inboard boats. Um, diesel stabilizers can prevent any problems caused by bad fuel. Um, so this is one that you definitely want to use before winter storage, but maybe you forgot to do it this year. Um, it's not a bad idea to add a little bit here in the springtime as well. Uh, most additives can increase performance, help cold starts, and increase fuel efficiency. 
Uh, Volvo does not have a fuel additive that they, you know, sell, but the one that they recommend is the Standardine product, uh, specifically the diesel fuel additive that you see here in the picture. Uh, for very cold climates, using a winter formula can help uh, that diesel fuel from gelling. Here in the Northwest, we don't have that issue, but uh, for some of your colder climate areas, um, I know you guys experience that a little bit more. Um, you'll definitely want to use something there in the winter time uh, to, to prevent that fuel from gelling. Uh, always use, uh, you know, the recommended instructions here, just like your holding tank additive. It's going to tell you, you know, use this many ounces per this many gallons. So always follow the directions right there on the additive containers. For gasoline powered engines, um, this one happens to be the Yamalube. I know the Suzuki boats have their own additives as well. It doesn't have to be the Yamaha brand. Uh, this just happens to be the, the one that we stock and sell in our parts department. Um, if it's me, if I have a Yamaha engine, I'm using their recommended additives. Um, these ones, just like the diesels, will prevent gum and varnish deposits. Uh, if you do have some existing gum and varnish, it'll help dissolve those systems in the fuel system. Uh, protects against any corrosion in the fuel system. Uh, help absorb any water in the fuel line system. Um, you know, gasoline boats, unlike diesels, aren't so prone to have um, condensation in the tanks. But if you do get any inside the tank, this will help to absorb some of that water. And it will also extend spark plug life. Um, so we have some, some owners that use this on every fill up. I would say if, um, you know, if I know if I'm going to burn through an entire tank of fuel, if I'm going on a long trip um, and, you know, I know I'm going to use that full tank, I'm probably not as concerned about using this additive. If the boat's going to sit for a long period of time, you know, over the winter time, uh, I would absolutely recommend adding a stabilizer. Uh, anytime you can, you always want to use an ethanol-free fuel. Um, I know here in the Northwest, 99% of the marinas are now using a um, ethanol free fuel on the water. For boats that are trailered, it's a little bit harder to find. Um, so at that point, you would want to, um, you know, use a different form of an additive to, to the tank. Uh, Yamaha recommends a 89 octane. Um, I think over the octane, more importantly, is the ethanol free. So if you were to, to ask me, hey, do I want 89 octane with ethanol or 87 uh, octane, octane ethanol free, I would always take the ethanol free fuel. Um, yeah, and if you're not able to get that ethanol free fuel, Yamalub does make, um, you know, a lot of different products, whether it's octane boosters um, or, you know, boosters for ethanol fuel. So next we'll talk a little, about, little bit about your fuel filters. Um, so on the inboard Volvo Penta diesel motors, um, there are going to be two fuel filters, a primary and a secondary. Both of those filters are uh, part of your annual maintenance that you'll do. Uh, these are also on that spare parts form that we talked about earlier uh, as good spares to carry. Um, you know, I'd say diesel has, you know, more issues related to, you know, water and fuel in that than gas boats. Uh, but this filter, in spe uh, you know, specifically is going to help you uh, to eliminate any water from that system. So this is your first line of defense in water. Um, water will basically, fuel will come from the tank. Any water in that system is gonna get separated by this filter and go down into the bowl here. Um, to, to, to drain or to replace the filter, uh, insert into this filter, first thing you wanna do is make sure your engine display and your battery switches are turned off. Uh, to change the primary filter here located in the engine bay, uh, a lot of times it's gonna be on the port side of the motor on the 31 here, it's on the port forward side of the engine room. Uh, place a container directly underneath the filter housing to collect any fuel after we pull the drain. Uh, you're gonna drain this filter housing by unscrewing the drain plug located at the bottom center of the housing. So it's not shown very well in this picture, but at the very bottom center of this filter is a single drain bolt. Very bottom bolt. Uh, you can almost see over on this side, there's another bolt. This bolt will have nothing to do with draining fuel. Uh, you'll never need to tighten or loosen that bolt. It's the center bottom bolt there at the bottom of the canister. Uh, to drain, you'll use a 14 millimeter wrench to remove the plug. Uh, once all the fluid or fuel is drained from this filter, you can unscrew the T-handle here, pull the cap off of the filter housing, 
and remove the filter from inside here. It's a paper filter insert um, that will basically just go right in the top of the filter there. Um, once you have that out, you'll reinstall the new filter. Uh, there's a new O-ring that comes for the cap as well as for the T-handle. Install your new O-rings, reinstall that T-handle, and also make sure that your plug is back in uh, on the bottom of the filter here. To change the secondary filter, so over to our right of here is where our primary was. Uh, this is the on the engine filter. This is a secondary fuel filter. Uh, happens to be on a brand new motor, so Volvo paints the engine. In this case, the, uh, the secondary filter got painted green, the same color as, uh, as the motor there. Uh, to change this filter, first thing to do is find it. Um, usually easy to find with the primer bulb right on top of the filter here. Uh, first step here is once you found it is you want to disconnect the water and fuel sensor connection. Uh, that water and fuel sensor is right at the bottom center of this filter, right on the bottom here. Um, second step, once you have that connection removed from the filter housing, is you're going to spin off this filter very similar to like an oil filter on your car. Um, you can use that same wrench that I used or, or showed earlier that I bought from Amazon. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier to get this filter off of the housing. Um, down below is a better picture of that water and fuel sensor. So to remove the sensor itself, all you'll do is you'll twist this to the left. I usually wait until I've spun the filter off. That way I don't lose all my fluid over the side of the engine there. Uh, to remove the connection here, which is step two, all you need to do is press in the spring clip here. So you can see it's on the right side of this connection. You will press in the spring clip and pull straight down. That will remove the connector from the sensor. Uh, at this point, you won't have any fuel draining from that uh, fuel filter. All you've done is you've removed the wire. So when you go to spin off the filter, it doesn't twist the wire. So remove the, uh, the filter itself, pull it out of the engine room there. Um, I usually just turn the filter upside down and, and empty it into a container. Um, once that's empty, you can then unscrew the water and fuel sensor, which is this item right here. Uh, be very careful with this sensor. It is plastic threads. Um, so when you're taking it off, but also when you're reapplying that sensor, when you're retightening that sensor, uh, it doesn't need to be extremely tight. All you're going to do is really finger tight and then about another quarter turn to avoid cracking the sensor. Um, it's not only a sensor, but it's also the drain plug for that filter. So you want to be very cautious with that sensor when you're reinstalling. Um, once the new, you know, filter has the sensor on it, you can re-spin on the new filter onto the housing here and then reconnect your sensor in the reverse order of removal. All you do is you press that sensor up and in towards the uh, water and fuel sensor. For priming the system, so Volvo recommends that you don't fill uh, either the primary or the secondary fuel, fuel filters after you've changed them. Um, instead of filling them up with fluid, what you're going to do is actually prime the system using the primer bulb here and a little bleeder nipple right here on the side of the filter. So first step here is to loosen up the bleeder nipple. Um, if I remember right, it's an 11 millimeter wrench that will loosen up this nipple. Uh, until you start pumping the primer bulb here, you won't have any fluid that flows out of that nipple, but I do like to have that same collection container underneath this area. Um, you could even put a small rubber hose on here that leads down to a collection container to avoid you know, spraying fuel all over the side of the boat here. Um, so once you have the nipple open here, collection container below the nipple, all you need to do is just press this primer bulb um, it's going to take you a good probably 75 to 100, um, you know, uh, push, pushes before you'll get any kind of flow out of the nipple here. I get the call a lot. People have the nipple open. Uh, they're, you know, pumping the primer bulb, but there's no fuel coming out. Um, you have to think you're filling up not only the entire primary filter, but also the secondary. So make sure the nipple's open and just continue to prime until you get a nice, stream of fuel coming out here into your collection container. At that point, you're going to retighten the nipple, and then you want to continue to prime until you feel the primer bulb pressurize. It'll be about another 10 or 15 um, presses until you'll feel that pressurize. 
At that point, both filters are filled back up and your system is repressurized. So back to our gasoline filters. Um, this is gonna be for the Yamaha. Um, this is one that is located in the center cockpit hatch. Um, you know, just like the outboard, the inboard, you're gonna have a primary and a secondary. Um, secondary is on the engine, primary is inside of the engine room or your center hatch. Um, this one happens to be on a 27 over on the port side bulkhead. Uh, so for replacing fuel filters on an outboard, there are two filters to change, the primary, which is shown in the picture here, um, and a secondary. So the primary here is due every 50 hours or annually. The secondary, which looks like my picture hasn't uh, shown up here. Uh, the secondary fuel filter, which is on the engine, uh, is one that you want to change annually. I have a picture of the secondary in the next slide here, so you'll get a better look of, uh, of what that looks like. Um, both of these filters are on an annual interval, but also on an hour interval. So this one you may replace in the middle of the season, depending on how much you're using the boat. Um, but I would stick to that every 50 hours on this one or the annual. Uh, if you don't hit those hours, then you're sticking to that every 12 months. To change the primary filter, you first have to locate it in the center hatch. Uh, that same filter wrench that I showed in the beginning slides, you can use to unscrew the primary fuel filter. Um, this one's not in such a compact area like our inboard boat, so a regular strap wrench works pretty well on this one. But, um, you know, if you have the strap wrench that I showed in the first couple of slides, it's going to make it a lot easier for you. Um, once you have that filter off of the, um, the bracket here, you can empty it out into a collection container and dispose of the filter. Um, spin on the new filter and then to repressurize this system are through your primer bulbs here. Uh, the boat in the picture here had a kicker and an out and a, you know your main motor. So one of the two hoses here goes to the kicker, the other one will go to the main. Uh, the easiest way to tell is that usually the main hose will have a little bit larger fuel supply than in this case the kicker will have a smaller hose. I believe it's a 3 8 fuel hose going to our, our main engine and a 5 16 hose going to the kicker motor. And then you'll just want to pump the primer bulbs until they're pressurized. Uh, they're going to be really easy to pump at first and same idea. It's going to fill this filter up with fuel. Once these two pressurize, then you're done. So this next slide is just talking a little bit more about those fuel primer bulbs. Um, just a little bit of a picture there to show you what they look like. All you're doing is squeezing those by hand until you feel, uh, you know, you feel them become firm. So this is the on the engine or the secondary fuel filter for the Yamaha. Um, this is a picture we found on uh, Amazon for a filter wrench. Yamaha does sell a wrench for this filter. Um, they don't recommend using a you know set of vice grips or anything just because it can eat up the sides of the filter housing here. So they have a specific wrench that looks similar to this that will slide up onto the housing and allow you to remove this plastic housing uh, to expose the filter inside. So step one, uh, remove the filter housing by unscrewing the two top bolts circled here and here. You can remove these two bolts and this entire assembly will come away from the engine and allow you to work a little bit easier on it. Uh, step number two is to unclip the sensor. So once this assembly is free from the motor, you'll notice a wire which leads to the water and fuel sensor for this system. Uh, all you'll do is you'll unclip that and then this will become free for you to work on it. Uh, using this filter wrench, you want to unscrew this filter housing, uh, making sure to have an appropriate container ready to collect any gasoline that spills out. Um, inside of that filter is going to be a cartridge filter or um, you know a paper filter that you'll replace. At that point you'll want to reinstall the housing here using that same wrench carefully not to, uh, to over tighten um, and then you know reinstall your connector, reinstall your two bolts um, and then go back and reprime that system using those two primer bulbs located in the center hatch. Thanks for joining us today uh, for spring maintenance part one. Um, I'm sure there will be a part two coming 
Um, as we talked about earlier, we're going to basically jump into a um, uh, kind of a, a question seminar where we're going to post a link on our Tug Nuts website today. And any questions you guys might have, post them on there. Uh, we're going to go through and we're going to pick uh, 10 or 15 of those to discuss on next week's seminar. And Tim, there's just a few follow-up questions I thought that uh, would be good ones just to ask you in, in uh, some of the past ones. But uh, the first one is if no Y valve, if you don't have a Y valve, how do you overboard discharge versus dockside pump out? Okay, so yeah, if you don't have a Y valve, there is no, there is no prior step to pumping out. So, Can you hear that? Yeah. No. So if you, um, if you don't have the Y valve on board, all you do is you remove the cap and pull the fluid right out of the tank. So um, on the boats that have the Y valve, you're basically picking, do I want to overboard discharge with a macerator or do I want to do a dockside pump out using the vacuum on the dock? So yeah, if you don't have the Y valve, there is no step prior to pulling the cap off and pulling the tank, uh, that fluid right out of the tank. And then the other one was, do you prime uh, the diesel filter? Like, do you pour diesel in it to, to uh, I'm guessing that's what the question is. Uh, you know, I, I've never had any, um, you know, success doing that. I've never done that. I usually just replace the filter dry. Um, one thing that might happen is you might start the heater and it may shut down. The fix there is just to start it up again. It's just a little bit of air in the system from that filter um, which would basically get into the system. At that point, you would just, uh, you know, turn off the heater, turn it back on. Every time the heater starts, it primes that fuel system using that little pump inside of the box. Perfect. And then, um, did you go through how many hours on the Yamaha filter change? Yeah, we did. So the, um, the filter inside the engine room or the primary is every 50 hours. The filter that's on the engine, the secondary, is every 100 hours. Perfect. Okay. Looks like uh, looks like that's a wrap. Awesome. Great job, Tim. Yep. Thank you, Jeff. Nice work. Thank you. Yeah, great work. <laughs> see you guys, yes. honey. All right. We'll, see you, and, uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.